to NDI for collaborating this proposal with us. Um, so, uh, my name is Fernanda. Uh, I am an Internet Lab director. Internet Lab is a think tank based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And a couple of years ago, we started to try to understand the movement of disinformation, creation, and circulation. Um, in this attempt, we have considered gender disinformation is one more type of gender-based violence. So, to understand this social phenomenon, uh, we need to assume that gender-based violence is a structural inequality that marks all society in different ways, online and offline. In the Brazilian case, for example, uh, we understood that gender disinformation is associated with narratives that enforce gender inequality, including uh, when it is propagated in support of the current government. To provoke us today, uh, I invite our speakers to introduce themselves and make a brief speech to answer the question. Um, can I put the slide, please? Uh, next. Uh, so I forgot to tell you about our session agenda. <laughs> so <laughs> I will direct one question to the speakers. After that, we will discuss in breakout, group, breakout groups. And after that, I will ask one of the uh, one of facilitator in the group to tell us what was discussed in a briefly way because we have one hour, so it's very fast. And the next, please. Ah, awesome. No. Okay. Not, I, I think I forget the slide of the mail. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> uh, please, uh, Dania is online with us. Thank you, Dania, because Dania is in Mexico City and there it is midnight. So, it's an unhappy moment. <laughs> but, uh, Dania, could you tell us a little about your work and how are you thinking about the gender disinformation? Uh, and please introduce yourself. Hello, can you tell me? Can you tell me? Can you tell me? Can you tell me? Uh, yes, we listen to you, but uh, we don't watch you, see you. Now? Yes, now. <laughs> we can. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm Dania Centeno. I'm a lawyer from Mexico, and I specialized in human rights, particularly in the in the digital sphere. I used to work with R3D, which is a Mexican NGO promoting for the protection of human rights in Mexico. After R3D, I, I used to work at Twitter as a public policy manager for Latin America. So that's pretty much my background. And I see R3D and later on at Twitter, I really specialized in working on safety, particularly from a gender-based perspective or, you know, targeting gender-based abuse online. In R3D, we, we made a coalition of NGOs working to address this topic in Latin America. And then at Twitter, I was also in charge of conducting um, several workshops and sessions to hear directly from several uh, NGOs and experts in the field about how they were, they were experiencing. And I must say, of course, gender-based misinformation was always an issue. It was often mentioned and often flagged because it has many different impacts that affect disproportionately 
gender communities, women and um, LGBTQ communities. And it's a real problem because there's, of course, no one solution fits all. There's no clear solution. There's no clear answer. But to understand the complexities around this issue is a very complicated task. So it's very important that we have sessions like this to discuss, especially from a global south perspective, to discuss how, how this issue is impacting in, in our region. And when I can say, at least from my experience working at Twitter and also in R3D, is that we really need to take our time to understand the, the root causes no, of this phenomenon and how it, it can um, extend so much as it was. And also the, the fact that sometimes it's really complicated to link the impacts of line of information online. And that's one of the main, I think, priorities we have at Twitter. I cannot speak on behalf of Twitter anymore, of course, but overall, I would say making sure we have this linkage, we can prove that linkage of how misinformation is being spread online and how it's actually targeting and impacting women and non-binary communities online. I think that's the real job and it's not easy, of course. And there's so much of an emotional impact that it's not, not, not easy to you know. And I think that's one of the main areas of concern, perhaps. And also how this can take so many shapes. For example, there are now groups that are dedicated, dedicated to do this and that might receive some sort of money or payment. And that seems super complicated. Like, how can you track this? And when it comes, for example, to platforms, it's also difficult for them to conduct such an investigation because there has there has to be public poli like policies at place that also come from governments to make sure this issue is taken into consideration because platforms cannot do not have the tools to investigate what happens outside of them. Like sometimes the coordination might take place on the platform, but also, sometimes the coordination might take place outside the platform, and that's what it's really like a trick to trace down. I wouldn't want to extend further than that, and I think we'll ramble a little bit. All that to say that, of course, it's a super prominent issue that needs to be addressed, that needs to be better understood, and that we need many stakeholders engaged in these conversations to make sure we understand all the different aspects of this. Thank you. Thank you, Dania. Um, I think, do you try, do you bring us some important questions related to the necessity that we understand that the circulation of this information is not restricted on online um, environment. So, in elections, Brazilian elections now, we watched a movement very uh, particular because the online gender-based violence, the political violence, and the violence on the streets uh, were very connected. And I think it's, it's a, a, a part of the problem that we need to, to think about uh, deeply. Um, now, I ask to... Malavika, uh, thank you. Thanks, Fernanda. Uh, hi, my name is Malavika Rajkumar. I'm a lawyer and I work at IT for Change in India. So uh, I guess uh, a lot of the issues that were spoken about right now and a lot, a lot of the uh, gender disinformation practices that happen across the global south, a lot of similarities that way, especially when it comes to uh, the election time or right before the, like one year before the election time, that's when we see a sort of hike in gender disinformation. So India especially has one of the largest democracies, high heterogeneity across axis, largest youth population, one of the largest global internet users and social media users across the board. So you can imagine the sort of violence that uh, uh, women politicians face online, especially uh, around election time. So one of the uh, main um, insights I'd like to bring to today's session is part of a study that we did on uh, abuse and misogynistic trolling that's been directed uh, on Twitter against um, 
women in the Indian political and public sphere. So we actually did this study because we wanted to understand the nature of online hate and recurring patterns of abuse. And secondly, also after understanding this, we wanted to see what sort of regulatory frameworks can actually be put in place uh, or can actually be suggested uh, to address this issue. Um, again, I'm going to uh, go straight to the findings, but we had actually done a very inductive exercise where we had gone through 30,460 mentions, annotated them in a very painstaking process using 19 codes, which we then made into seven codes. Like, for instance, if we take a theme of threat, we had intimidation and violent explicit threats as categories. and. Um, Again, after this annotation process, after we um, focused on abusive, misogynistic, and uh, violent um, um, mentions, we were able to get a lot of interesting insights, which I'd like to share here. First is that the pervasiveness of misogynistic speech is actually uh, so normalized in the Indian Twitter sphere that it's not even surprising anymore. Even as a user of Twitter, I know that if I put any political uh, message out there, I will face some form of violence. So uh, one thing that was very clear was that women belonging to the ruling party, perceived to be dissenters, sympathetic to the current disposition, all faced violence. Specific targets of violence included women who are left-leaning, dissenters, and those women that belong to opposition parties. And this also included women that were not even on the platform. So there was a hashtag, uh, the name of the woman, who was belonging to the opposition party that wasn't part of the platform. Another intersection that received a lot of hate was Muslim women and those who don't have party affiliations, especially some political commentators. Uh, secondly, in terms of the sort of herd aggression that we saw with the way trolls actually attack women, trolls tend to tag certain women together as if to like deride, uh, warn them or intimidate them to actually de-platformize themselves from the platform. This specifically included Muslim women and Dalit women. That, that's like a particular caste-based violence that is seen in India. And uh, another interesting finding was the light-hearted trolling that was present on against these women. So they were not overly grave um, threats, which were also visible, which includes violence, rape threats, death threats. But these were uh, milder, fun, abusive sort of wordplay or memes. And they also create a lot of psychological impact on like women who are actually seeing this all the time. So the abuse rarely had anything to do with their work or politics. That is one of the core research finding that we found. It's mostly to do with their bodies or their character. So if it had anything remotely to do with politics, it was to actually attack the woman's credentials, trivialize their role in politics, talk about their appearance, including all beauty, no brains, which is actually an example that we have, and sort of derailing, where you take a random incident that has nothing to do with them and then make it their issue and sort of cause a lot of, sort of like perpetuate violence on that. Another um, overarching subtext that we got is the role of patriarchy in here. First is uh, the sort of angles of shame and honor that kept coming up again and again. The terms shame, shameless, honor, lanat and sharam, which are Hindi words. So India has a lot of languages, so the violence happens in multilingual formats. Shame on you and hang your head in shame were repeated a lot of times. For instance, one of the uh, mentions says, poor father, shame on her. So these were the kind of attacks that women politicians were receiving. And they are usually, uh, it's very clear in South Asia, there's a lot of, they're usually subjects of male authority or control. Their bodies become repositories of community values. And this includes like women in public politics. And their bodies become sites of contestations of family, community, national honor even plays out. Another angle is caste-based violence. So women who are attacked, who were, particularly Dalits or other caste members, they were attacked based on their purity or honor. Secondly, um, they were also, their merit was also called into question. Or in Hindi, as you call it, Aukat, like what are you doing here, was the question that was usually posed to them. Then uh, anti-Muslim hate, which was uh, extremely like 
um, visible and um, sort of one of the main reasons uh, when gender disinformation becomes disproportionately high is when there's a religious angle to it. So usually the women were attacked for many reasons, including hyper-nationalistic attacks, reference to nationality, asserting exclusive claim over national identities, collusion with foreign intelligence, treason, based on hate for the religion itself, which means distorting the way Islam plays a role in India. And uh, the term jihad was also reused quite a bit. And my last point, which is uh, a lot of objectification also happened where uh, women's bodies were subject to male desire or hypersexualization. Where, for instance, if there's a picture of the woman, then there would be a deep fake that circulates and trolls would come on to her Twitter thread and abuse her. So, I mean, there's a lot more to say, but uh, these were the primary experiences that women are facing in India. And it's something that uh, is, I'm pretty sure, like if we did a study on Facebook or any other platform, we'd get very similar results. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, very interesting to listen uh, to you about the the way that we facing the violence and the categories that we find. I think there is very a uh, moment that is similar what happened in different countries in Global South. When I, I was listening to you, I was thinking about the Brazilian context and could be me <laughs> yeah. say the, the same thing or very similar things. Um, Moira, can you? Sure, I'm happy and I think on that point is the perfect point to uh, segue to what I wanted to share with you all today. So the National Democratic Institute, as, as some of you heard me say yesterday, came to this issue, we like to say because it came to us. The issue of gender-based violence and online violence against women in politics was the number one reason globally that we understood women to decide to not run for office. Um, so from that standpoint, we've identified it as uh, existential to the future of democracy, but also a game changer, meaning if we can make progress in this particular area, we can really change the nature of elected systems around the world. But we really came to this and we started from it because we saw studies like the one in India, the one in Brazil, and we were noticing that in each space it was treated as sort of, oh, well, that just happens here. It's the price of doing business. You've chosen to enter the public sphere. Um, so, so this is the cost. Um, so we, we really, what we wanted to do is demonstrate a global challenge that we're facing and show that these attacks, much like we're seeing, that extend beyond threats of violence and into um, gender-based attacks of the ones we heard about religiously motivated, uh, to use a, a trite but very famous U.S. but her emails. Um, about Hillary Clinton, right? It, it's not, it's hard for an algorithm to identify that. It's hard to identify it as a gender-based attack, but in fact, it is. So what we did is we had done a significant amount of research, a significant amount of work in identifying hate speech lexicons that we shared with platforms, um, and we were finding ourselves uh, at a crossroads where what we wanted to do was go back to the same political women and ask them what the solutions would be. So we looked at three different tracks along those of tech companies, governance, uh, and civil society, and globally convened, uh, I believe, eight different uh, working groups, uh, consulted with about 100 women uh, in the political sphere and identified 24 interventions that we now look to. You can find them online at ndi.org. Um, it's, uh, it's the interventions for ending online violence against women in politics. Um, and we view that as sort of the menu, right? Because what we also learned is that regionally there are different opportunities for success. There are, in some areas, legislation may help. In other areas, legislation is simply not possible, right? 
Um, so we view that as a menu, and now what we're doing is uh, sort of splitting our efforts. One, to look at the issue of platform accountability and getting platforms to come to the table and address this issue, and the separate one to look at governance structures. Um, we feel like NDI has a unique contribution to make around things like political party uh, codes of conduct and uh, conduct within parliaments, things that we can really help to change the political discourse to make this, uh, make this issue. Uh, what we're looking for is to create a normative framework where this is taken off the table. Um, so uh, hold on one second. So I, I think just two points I wanted to uh, leave you with. Uh, one was identifying one of the challenges we're facing right now with tech companies. So Fernanda joined me and a group of other women, I think Irene was here, um, uh, visiting with tech companies um, very recently. Um, and I would point out that I think we are at a crossroads and a major challenge where we have the most significant led, uh, regulation from the EU coming at the tech companies that they have seen, but also at a time where their industry is facing a lot of financial challenges. We're also, also witnessing the challenges with Twitter. Um, and uh, that, that poses a big problem. Because what we saw in this particular area was that the platform desire to not be blamed for bad things happening, which is ultimately where we are. Where NDI is, we want to create a positive information space for the full inclusion of all people. Where they are is very much, how do we not be blamed? That then matches very closely with the cultural dynamics we see around the world of like, this is the cost that women face you know, if you decide to get involved in politics. So those very nefarious attitudes are, are at the core of what is preventing progress on this. And when you match that with budgetary concerns as well, and the fact that this was, we heard this over and over again, that this is a cost center for tech companies rather than a value proposition of what a platform can bring to society, um, we face uh, an uphill battle. On the government side, though, I do want to leave us on a point of optimism to say that we've seen the, uh, we also talked with uh, other governments uh, that are working with the partnership to end online violence against women in politics. This is, you can Google that as well. There are eight allied governments uh, that are forming an alliance to address these challenges. So the likes of the United States, Denmark, Australia, South Korea, really looking at this and concentrating on this issue. So that's coming, it's co-chaired by the United States and Denmark, I believe. Um, but that also comes at a time when UN women will convene around CSW and use technology as one of the convening issues that are bringing them together. And I think one of the things that we have as a community to look at are how we mobilize and utilize those unique opportunities with the stars aligning in that way to really see real progress on these fronts and to identify which interventions we can push them towards. And so I would leave us with one, which is basically when we look at CSW, when we see those opportunities, we wanna make sure that we're capturing both sides of this, this challenge. One being individual violence, right? Women facing doxing, attacks, you know, things that we all, I'm quite sure in this room have experienced and online, um, but also where it is weaponized for political purposes. And we want to make sure to capture both elements of that because they require different interventions and different approaches, but there, we would be doing a disservice to where we, what we can achieve as a community if we limit ourselves to just one perspective versus the other. So I think taking the broadest possible aperture and recognizing that that political aspect, not only is it being weaponized, it's also our opportunity for change, right? Because those are the people, the women who are going to make that change for us. So I can stop there. Thank you, Moira. Um, I think it's important to consider that when we talk about uh, gender disinformation um, and consequently about gender-based violence, um, we are 
talking uh, about one thing that impacts all society, not just not all women, but the democracy. So one of the solutions that appeared when we talk about it, it is content moderation or on the other side, the regulation. But uh, we have so many challenges uh, related to language, related to political context in different countries. And I think we need to be more creative and imagine other solutions. So I invite you to divide in four groups, I think, four or five groups, to discuss. Uh, please, could put the slides again. Um, to discuss the experience that you have with this debate, or the questions that you have, or uh, besides that, how we can think about uh, this problem in a cross way. It is a, a global problem with different actors uh, and stakeholders involved, and how we can improve the, or mitigate this problem. Um, so there are here some guiding questions that you can use. Uh, and please introduce yourselves in, in discussion. I will um, advise you when the time is finished. Okay, thank you. So, four groups. I think we can use the the way that you sit. <laughs>
working for social change. Just like what Jacqueline mentioned, we build a digital community for the young people, with the young people. And uh, we also provide different type of media, digital media solutions for our partners uh, globally. We also have a um, uh, RW Media Training Center. And we provide this kind of uh, tailor-made training on storytelling, on campaigning, on creating media to counter this information, for example. Yeah, I'm quite interested in this, uh, this information, this kind of topic from gender lens. That's why I'm here. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. so it goes through the question? Yes. <laughs> How does misinformation relate to gender inequalities in your country? Are there disinformation strategies specifically targeting historically minorities? So, Ms. I'm curious to know what's been the impact of such a provision. This information strategy has on and gender based violence law to start with. Do you know that there's political violence now in this? is interesting. So, what kind of in Brazil, have you seen? Has anyone gone to court? Yeah, actually, uh, there is a lot of violence. There are many issues of violence in the world. Different layers of inequality in Brazil, and of course, they, they come together. Our elections. Um, and I think that in our work with the team, there are some narratives that are created and constantly elaborated. It's good. 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 Because there's a lot of social economy, racial inequalities, there's a lot of narratives. We have to tell you about, let's say, the technology. Sometimes it's really a challenge effect. Whenever there's a community or something, there's very frequently a lot of people saying that we have died trends in this love story. There's no evidence about it, so that's what it takes to be passed. So this is like a one example perpetrator binary sort of angle to this law, right? Yeah. It's not really addressing a systemic issue. Yeah. 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 Um, so you identify five, six trolls. 
interview, and then you take them to court, something like that. Okay. You can find the specific charge and how this was affected and how it changes the group. Last thing, as there were images spread about they received images supposedly depicting her sitting on the left and the person's and it was clearly not her. Mm. If you look at the picture, like if you look at her picture, you'd see that it was clearly not her. That it just spread like fire. Yes, you know, it was spread really fast. It really has to do with the presentation that people have of black women coming from slums and like associating with men in a way. So because that stuff really well with the presentation that people have, uh, it spread even though we have to write it. There's some people up in court in high years who are still today. Anyone else would like to share their experience? Well, maybe she was competitive. Uh, uh, the fight between politicians and the uh, uh, So, yeah, I think that the image has how so all those yes, there are issues. Thank you. 
I'm just lucky, I guess. I mean, uh, first of all, so even we, uh, we do see people are not that much of our Twitter, Twitter, especially about with the fact checking you know, who I am. It is not so only the normal uh, uh, online group, it's the high level now. politicians uh, uh, who really actually show not only from the booming and everything that they do. Even if we try to monitor and see all that toxic and violent content, we are really hard for. My mental health and my colleagues as well, because we don't have any uh, professional help or guidance or anything about how to deal with these issues. Uh, it was really challenging, but I mean, with uh, NDI, with NDI, so um, actually to uh, create more awareness within the media and also with the communities. Like that is the level that we can. So uh, once this awareness and people consider it as um, something that is actually we will be pushing to the legal aspect as well. But until then, I don't know how we are going to Sorry, it's not seen as uh, like an issue, it's seen as kind of a given. Do you mean more that people... Um, we have more two minutes. Okay. about uh, good practices yeah. and I think um, for me I think early, early reporters as an individual we really play a key part in curbing the disinformation. In Kenya we have a movement called um, Kenyans on Twitter. 
the a topic comes and it escalates and escalates in your the discussion, your the topic of discussion. But if an individual reported um, the the topic or the tweet made um, early, I, I think it it comes um, it comes the uh, disinformation trend early enough. So and also the the, the involving expertise uh, who are expertise in um, social media monitoring, uh, the meta, I report to them early, they are able to come the disinformation. So also as an individual or as individual, we have a role to play. We should not wait for stakeholders, governments, laws. It will take years, probably years, months before legislation uh, come in. So as individuals, maybe we could report the tweets, um, uh, the social media postings that uh, we are really sure it's some um, disinformation to the agenda. Yeah. So early reporting and early warning. Just to piggyback on that, uh, trusted flaggers will be implemented by many platforms and I think that's a possibility to come in exactly um, there. Uh, you mentioned um, structural measures and I think platforms have risk government, uh, governance um, uh, kind of um, processes and um, uh, these have to be influenced. And the DSA mentioned by you, the Digital Services Act, provides for a governance uh, for an agenda to do that, but I think um, many other countries could come in on that. Uh, specifically because it also contains participatory elements and that's super important, especially in this case, um, uh, to understand even um, how vulnerable groups uh, feel or what's microaggression for women, which I um, worry about a lot. Also, you mentioned the effects on girls, um, uh, which perceive that also as a microaggression on, on them. So I think to tackle this governance process is super important and when you, um, in these cases, I think the campaigning aspect of it, that's what we saw in Germany, where two uh, women leaders really took on, um, went to court, but also made this very public, uh, and this had a very, very good effect, because it lessened the kind of anonymity online of, of people, you know, thinking they can do uh, whatever they... <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, uh, hearing all of you, uh, I would like to share two cases, cases that happened in Nepal. Uh, when you talk about online violence and especially harassment issues uh, in a small country like Nepal, it, it is like negligible. People don't even report. There is no consideration. Uh, we did a survey in 2016 about online violence and it is like, you know, nobody cares, right? So now what has happened is uh, recently a case of uh, an actor who raped a girl. Uh, her name uh, was Samit Shah Thapa. Um, so she kind of like uh, went to the court uh, and filed a case against this guy. As soon as the case went on, uh, it, it was like previously it was uh, said she was underage, right? She was under 18. And, 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 and then the media started picking it up. The, the fans started picking it up. And there was so much of chaos created. I mean to say your, her character was completely assassinated. Uh, it, it went through a different channel. So, you know, the social media was like grabbed on by the fans. Uh, the, the media was trying to grab on to the media attention that was coming in. So all, all sorts of news were coming out. Uh, as you know, governments in, in the South are least bothered about, you know, media and what, what they are doing, and especially the craze of so-called the YouTubers, you know, they, they kind of like make any news. So that happened, and after that, another case, uh, a reputed uh, cricketer, Sandeep Lamichani, he's like, uh, he plays internationally, so, uh, and even in India, uh, and, and that case came out, and, and then, you know, again, this sort of things started. So, so, so there has been a lot of talk in, in, in context of the civil society about how to mitigate this problem uh, in terms of law, in terms of policies, uh, in, terms, in terms of helping the victim because ultimately if somebody is coming out it's more painful for, for them because they have to relive that right and nobody's understanding this that is the problem that is face and, and they have very less resources and uh, you know you might have heard about mighty nepal an organization which is like you know the, this uh, sushma kairala she got the cnn hero as well and even that organization was attacked I mean to say they were, uh, in, uh, the, 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 the victim was put into custody, right? Uh, yeah. I mean to say, not in custody, but you know, they had to place her somewhere. So they placed her under that organization, because that organization uh, works under women leadership and 
you know, let me tell you, that organization was, was like blown away about its reputation, saying, okay, what are they doing? Why are they putting her up? You know, the reputation of the bigger cricketer was winning it off. Nobody was uh, trying to know what the situation, the CCTV is, the proofs were there, the rule, you know, like every everything was done. So this is the situation in Asia, especially with, you know, and, and the disinformation spread in by the media is the worst thing because they don't have any awareness, especially about the situation, about the condition that they, that they get into, right? Because because it is it is the fact that, you know, a point has come where we have to realize what is a news-making process because a news-making process goes to different processes, right? It, a news can't be a news without uh, being checked and rechecked and again uh, confirmed and then only it comes out. And then how come all these uh, mistakes are happening? Uh, you know, the, the YouTubers, they, they, they say anything and everything for the views. So, 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 you know, there has been a lot of debate that is going on. Uh, but the things are at, at, at surface level, you know, the values is what is needed. And I think if, if any organization is there, I believe we need to bring in these media organizations and give them the values. Values is very important. If values are not there, you know, like these random things, they understand the thing, but still, they, they, it's like news making process has gone into the whole, uh, dived into the business perspective. So they, they just took. It's sensational. Right. Because, like, what is sensational it? news, right? Yeah. People do look in, right? And they, they don't verify, they, they just like get the news and they publish it. Sometimes use a clickbait. Clickbait, yeah, yeah clickbait. You make also a really good point about the accident. And they come up, right? Politicians, they didn't yeah. walk in the front door and know they would be entering the arena. They were just living their lives. And many issues in the intersection of all of this. What is information? What is information? We have to define this in our laws too. Because it's not clear. If it, we have a new decree, a national decree about like cyber crimes and say it's information, but it's there is a whole controversial thing in Tunisia now because people are afraid it's going to be used to limit the freedom of speech. Right. Because yeah. there is no definition of what it is information. So whoever is going to apply this law will need to interpret it the way so true, so true. We, we think it is. Also, there is a fact-checking issue after right. you define There's also the, the question of should governments be really right. be involved in the right. moderation. Right. It should be civil right. society. Right. That's a problem. If they come in, you know, there is this whole regulated thing. If they don't look at the random things that are happening you know it's it, it's 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 the civil society is like in the middle so do you work with a civil society organization that does a lot of fact checking around elections times around covid and they're moving into the agenda and campaign for next year but they work with government in quite useful ways so during covid they would work with the ministry of health to say we receive all of these tweets all of these posts sorry we need to return So, um, please choose one of the group to present us what you discuss. I think uh, I can start to some what we debated in our group, and um, I need to to say that I'm sad because the the discussion was so rich and the time uh, 
finish <laughs> fast. <laughs> but um, the, the first thing that appeared in my group was the fact that uh, political gender uh, based violence and the number of women in the parliament and other public sphere is very related because this social phenomenon um, limits the, the presence of women. So we discussed uh, about different women uh, that are targeted to political gender violence, not just uh, politicians, but also activists, um, journalists, and the attempt is to direct this, these questions in legislations, but it's not enough because we uh, comprehended that it's not a, a thing related just to the online environment, but also site. So fact checking, for example, uh, okay, it's a good thing, but it's not enough because we have more um, challenges. And the education appeared in our group as a crucial, uh, essential tool because sometimes um, people know uh, what is fake news, what is disinformation, but they decide to uh, believe in the things that make sense in the religion, in the groups that they are. Uh, so it's a, a huge issue to address. And I think, um, I think it, it was it. Uh, I don't know if you want to compliment something. Is this working now? Hi. So just one final compliment, uh, something that I would like to add is that thank you so much for summarizing is that um, well, I feel like big tech and algorithms should always be considered as a big part of the equation. These companies are huge companies. They are multi-billion dollar and they have all kind of human resource, technical expertise and any kind of capacity to end hate, identify, find the nuances and languages, hire people from different countries. Um, so, um, and there's a financial motive. Hate speech and misinformation is making money. It is helping people, it's motivating people to be online and get attention. And once we remember that these big companies are actually behind all of um, all of this hate speech, then we can kind of push forward for, uh, just like you said, plat platform accountability. Uh, so that's something I would like to highlight. Thank you. Um, maybe the, the group this side? Um, in our group, we were mostly sharing experiences, and I thank everyone for sharing their experiences. So uh, we were speaking of how different local contexts uh, really play out in developing the narratives that sustain uh, gender disinformation. So we're speaking of Sri Lanka, Uganda, Brazil, Ethiopia, and we even had an example of someone who works with fact check checking in our group, and because of being a woman, has been targeted uh, with uh, hate and uh, insults. And this is something that we were speaking about a lot about the work of um, working with disinformation and being uh, a woman and having to face those narratives too. But I don't know if someone else wants to add, but I think the thing about the local culture narratives playing a role was mostly of what we discussed. We didn't really get to discuss uh, platforms or solutions. We were really involved in getting the stories. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you, group, for sharing. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, you? <laughs> Um, we have done pretty much the same, we share experiences. We had in our group Brazil, Ghana, um, Germany, 
and you're from Germany too, so, so is this. And we are talking about our problems in our countries, the solutions and the effectiveness of the strategies we pretty much share and try to learn a bit more about the differences and the, sim the, the, things, the things in common we have in our cultures and our societies. It's pretty much this. If you want, if anyone want to share more, thank you so much for sharing. Maybe to add on some of the um, like entry points for action that we've been discussing was to uh, think about um, alliance building and organizing amongst journalists, uh, civil society actors, um, uh, and activists and also politicians to, to, to tackle this issue because oftentimes legislation also takes a lot of time. Um, another point has been uh, raising awareness amongst uh, police officers um, because um, persecution also needs um, people <laughs> who actually follow up on that case. And uh, another point has been that has been mentioned before by uh, other groups already is the point of biased uh, algorithms and AI and how to um, unbias basically the, the algorithms that are supposed to detect. Thank you. Next, please. Thank you. Um, I, I think I'll do a quick summary and then all of you can definitely add on. So uh, it's been a great uh, group here. They've had wonderful like insights to bring and also really effective solutions. So uh, just summarizing quickly, in Tunisia, a lot of uh, women candidates are targeted, especially on the basis of their gendered roles. But it's very interesting because they've adopted, they already have an online gender-based law, but political violence is a specific category that's now been adopted. So a lot of trainings are required, a lot of SOPs are required, as you had mentioned. But uh, again, it's the victim-perpetrator binary that's being re-perpetuated again in law. So again, you have to take the trolls to court, basically, or whoever has had you to code. In Kenya, especially during the election period, there's a lot of uh, disinformation campaign. Uh, creating awareness through multi-stakeholder capacities like Kitka Net is one of the solutions that has actually been working. Different forms of violence are there on the internet, but it's important to understand the sort of post-trauma experience of the women who sort of face this dichotomy where they lose, but they're also trolled. So. Online gender-based violence and disinformation campaigns are a reflection of the patriarchy that's being perpetuated in the country. So that's very important to understand. Uh, again, countries like Kenya and India don't have a legal basis, or don't have a law to actually address this. So that's also a big gap. And uh, judicial training is something that I think we all agree across the board. So that is also a point, that is a good solution that's required. In Maldives especially, misinformation is quite normalized like in most South Asian nations. And women don't really engage or talk about it. Uh, but it's interesting how the um, factors include language attacks, like for not knowing a specific regional dialect or regional language for that matter. Um, but at the same time, it's important to understand how languages play a big role because you sort of bypass the artificial intelligence and trolls still perpetuate the sort of violence online. Uh, then um, uh, it's also an interesting fact that all politicians, regardless of how high they are in the political spectrum or position, face very similar forms of violence. And media awareness and community building is a very good solution that's actually being implemented. Some good practices in Kenya that also uh, have been mentioned include early reporting as an individual, because there's this group called Kenyans on Twitter. Sorry, it's just so good. I just want to finish it. <laughs> just one minute, and then we're off. So they have this thing called Kenyans on Twitter, where they've been like invoking expertise on social media monitoring and sort of speaking to social media platforms that way. And in um, 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 like, for instance, it's important that platform we uh, look into platforms that have risk governance processes, and also look at uh, tackling the governance aspect of disinformation, which also includes the way DSA has been functioning on a participatory element. And um, in Germany, for instance, there were um, 
even though the cases were taken to court, the campaigns that came with it actually put the issue into the forefront, which was quite important. Just two last points. One is in Nepal, again, South Asian perspectives where uh, no one really cares about the issue. But it's important to note that the emotional trauma to actually bring about the issue is, again, um, again visible and resources are also low to come forth because if you really want to come forward and bring up this issue it's it's a lot of it's it's a lot of toll on the woman especially and um, misinformation and disinformation must be defined in our laws and it's also interesting to note that you have to actually tie it up with freedom of speech and expression and this is across all jurisdictions uh, fact checking is a big issue but south africa has a very great solution and i end with this which is that they have this um, she's actually been working on it there's a platform run by civil society where users can actually come and upload the sort of uh, gender disinformation online violence issues that are there and there's an expert panel that reviews it and there's a recommendation made and it's taken back to the tech company which brings me back to a bigger question which is how involved should government be and how much more involved should civil society actually be? There's a requirement in the second half. So it was a very great discussion. <laughs> I can't see. <laughs> uh, we need to finish because the other session will start. But I really appreciate uh, for sharing with you and listening to different uh, perspectives, different countries in Global South, so thank you and I hope that the session uh, provides you some contacts and we can do comparisons in the next months. Thank you. Thank you.